Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so excited to welcome you all to today's Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of wonder and of exploration to change our world. Um, the very heart of our National Geographic community is of course our National Geographic Explorers. National Geographic Explorers are powerful storytellers, cutting edge researchers, amazing scientists, photographers and filmmakers, adventurers and explorers. They're so cool, they're so wonderful. And this Explorer Classroom program is designed to connect all of you, students from around the world, directly to them. In addition to all of our normal events, we're also offering Explorer Classroom every day every weekday i should say please don't please don't try and come back tomorrow every weekday at 2 p.m eastern time so if you'd like on monday i can see you right back here for another great event but for today we're lucky to be joined by alexis michaelo alexis studies fossils of ice age ecosystems that are preserved in tar pits She's joining us today to teach us all about ancient life and about the modern tools it takes to uncover and investigate it. I can't wait to hear all about it. But before we do that, I do want to acknowledge that we're joined by hundreds and hundreds of students on YouTube. Say hi, let us know where you're watching from. I'd love to give you guys some shout outs. Um, additionally, we're joined on screen by dozens of students today. It's very exciting. I can't wait to take all of your questions at the end, but for now, that is plenty from me. I'm going to turn it over to Alexis for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I'm going to start sharing my screen so we can all see the presentation. All right, can everyone see the screen? Great. Well, thank you so much for tuning in with me today. I'm so excited to tell you about the work that I do um, as part of being an explorer with National Geographic. So I'm going to talk about ancient tar pits. And in today's presentation, we'll go over thinking about how do paleontologists use fossils to understand past ecosystems. We'll learn about what's a tar pit and why they're so special and awesome. And I might just be biased because I work on tar pits, but I think by the end, you'll think they're special too. We'll talk about what was the ice age like in Los Angeles and Trinidad. So from North America, all the way to the Caribbean. And a really important question, are tar pits still around today? And I know in paleontology, a lot of people think that all paleontologists study dinosaurs, but I'm just gonna let you know that in today's talk, we're talking about Ice Age mammals, which is way later than the time of the dinosaurs. So no dinosaurs today. So first, what is a tar pit? You may have seen tar pits in some cartoons like on SpongeBob and the Bikini Bottom tar pits or in The Simpsons. Um, but what I actually need to tell you is that it's not actually tar. So it's not tar, but naturally occurring asphalt. So if you look outside or you've been to the city, you've been driving on a road, you're probably driving on a black road and that's actually asphalt. And believe it or not, that asphalt is natural in some places around the world where they actually dig it out of the ground and then ship it to go make roads in other places. So we're talking about naturally occurring asphalt. So not like a parking lot, but actually where it occurs in the wild. And this is something that amazed me when I first learned about it, that you can be hiking through the woods in certain places of the world and come across what looks like a parking lot, but it's actually natural there on its own. And so in thinking about a tar pit, you might wonder, well, how does that asphalt get there in the first place? And it's because in some places around the world, there's oil underground. And sometimes that oil is able to start coming up to the surface from underground, moving upwards. And when it reaches the surface, a lot of the gas has gone away, leaving that very sticky asphalt. And because it's so sticky, when things fall into it, they get stuck. So the natural asphalt can preserve the remains of past life, so plants and animals. So here you see a picture actually from the park in Los Angeles today where those leaves are getting stuck in the naturally occurring asphalt. And a common question I get is, while I see the asphalt bubbling, is it hot? And the answer is no, it actually isn't hot. So that's one of the um, 
interesting facts about tar pits that I think people may have in their mind that actually it's not hot. It's bubbling because of naturally occurring gases getting out. And one thing we've discovered is that animals may have been attracted to the asphalt in the past because it looks really shiny, like it might be water. And so maybe they came over thinking it was water or maybe they didn't notice when they were getting stuck in just a little bit of it. But in many cases, there would be a big herbivore, like a mammoth that would get stuck. And then secondarily, the carnivores, like a saber-toothed cat, might hear the animal crying out as it's dying and then the saber-toothed cats would come and they would get stuck. And so we'd have these series of one animal getting stuck, then others coming and getting stuck as well. And so over thousands of years, that's resulted in these really beautiful and dense fossil deposits, like you can see here with all of these bones mixed into really sticky dirt. And so why are tar pits so special? To me, as someone who studies the past and ecosystems of the past, they're so special because they preserve entire ecosystems. And so within them, you can actually see insects, plants, mollusks like snails, and vertebrates, but not just big vertebrates like saber-toothed cats, but also little ones like small rodents and frogs and birds. And so you get a picture of the whole environment in that area, which you don't often get in most fossil deposits. So you might be wondering, well, is there a tar pit by me? Where can I go see them or study them? And so there's several places in the world that we know of right now, including California, in the Caribbean, like Cuba and Trinidad, and then in South America, including Venezuela, Ecuador, and Peru. Um, and we also know of one in Azerbaijan. But what we think is that there's actually a lot more, and we actually need to get out there and explore and try and find these other tar pit sites. And so today I'll tell you about one in California and one in the Caribbean that I've been working at. So in California, it's probably the most famous tar pit in the world. It's called Rancho La Brea and it's right in the middle of Los Angeles, really, really close to Hollywood. Um, and so it's right in the middle of this urban area. And that's what I think is so cool about it is that if you go there today in the middle of Los Angeles, you can watch paleontologists pulling fossils out in the middle of the city. It's so cool. And we actually have millions of specimens. So not hundreds, not thousands, millions from this one site. And we can use all of that to understand what Los Angeles looked like in the past. And the reason we have so many fossils is that it's actually been excavated for more than a hundred years. So these are some historic photographs of when the site was first discovered and studied. And so back in the early 1900s, when they first found oil in the area, they also found fossils. And so earlier paleontologists had a chance to go dig up as many fossils as they possibly could, um, resulting in these giant collections of megafaunal mammals like mammoths and dire wolves that we study to this day. And as I mentioned, we're still excavating there. And you might be wondering, well, how do you even excavate or dig up fossils in a tar pit, right? You must fall in and get stuck. And actually it turns out that digging in a tar pit is really just digging very sticky dirt because it's not liquid asphalt. It's actually just dirt that's been covered in the sticky asphalt. And so we have to use special tools and chemicals, but believe it or not, one of the most important tools we use is the same your dentist is to clean your teeth, like a little dental pick. So we actually work with the same tools that you might see when you go visit the dentist. And we use that to carefully brush away a lot of the sticky dirt that's sticking to the bones. And then we, in addition to looking at these big bones separately, we also keep that sticky dirt and put it through a series of sieves, which you can see in these buckets here, to make sure that we're not just studying the really big things, but that we're also paying attention to all the small vertebrates like rodents and birds and frogs and turtles and also getting a picture of what the plants look like too. And if you get a chance to ever come to the museum you'll see that we have this incredible collection of giant ice age mammals from California. So things like giant ground sloths, American lions, saber-toothed cats, mammoths, and even camels. That's another one that people don't think about that used to live in North America. But from my perspective, as someone who studies small animals, I also love working with the material from Los Angeles because we have these unexpected small fossils, 
like these 50,000 year old coprolites, which are really fossil feces. So we actually found these and you might recognize these if you're like me and have a pet rat. Um, these are actually 50,000 year old feces from a native wood rat that lived in Los Angeles. And so we actually found these preserved from the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. And so by combining all of the big fossils and all of the small fossils from animals and plants and mollusks and insects, all that we can possibly find, we actually are able to get a picture and see what Ice Age Los Angeles looked like. And it was so much more diverse. There were so many big mammals on the landscape and we're still learning more about it today. Now we're really focusing on the plants and trying to understand what the plants would have looked like at this time. Because if we want to know what the animals were doing, we need to know what the plants look like and what food they might have had access to. So then briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in Trinidad with my explorations there, because we know virtually nothing about the tar pits there. And so Trinidad is really cool because it's located in the Caribbean, but it's right between the Caribbean islands and South America. And so if you go there, it's an incredible diversity of animals living there in the present day. It's as if you took a forest and, and grassland in Venezuela and just moved it to an island. So it has way more species than you would expect for a place its size. It has species like tamanduas, like these anteaters, ocelots, monkeys, incredible birds like the scarlet ibis. It's just such a fascinating place in the present day. And so when I got there and saw all of this diversity, it made me wonder, well, if it's this diverse today, what was the past like? What did it look like here in the Ice Age on Trinidad? And so we went to the largest natural asphalt deposit in the world, which is in Trinidad. It's called Pitch Lake. And it's also been excavated um, to use for commercial asphalt production to make roads around the world, like this historic photo. So it's been explored for a long time as well. But even though it's an asphalt site, there's actually no Ice Age fossils from this site. It's only archaeological material or material related to humans at this site. So nothing from the Ice Age yet. So we had to keep looking. So what we actually did was try and follow clues from old field reports to find fossils. So we went back and looked at old reports from oil companies in different languages to try and figure out, oh, it seems like there are some fossils coming out. Can we go back to those sites and open them up again and start exploring once again? And so we tracked down from these old documents. We actually went through Trinidad, drove around trying to find those same sites and we actually found them. And so the fossils that we're working with now from Trinidad reveal this entire world that we had no idea existed on this island because they're preserved in asphalt. And so they were preserved much better than any other fossils on the island we found. And so it tells us things like there were um, relatives of llamas there. There were relatives of elephants, the gomphotheres, which is pretty awesome to think about that there were elephant relatives living on a Caribbean island. Um, there were also three families of sloth, which is really cool. So there was giant sloths, some of the biggest ever alive, but then also the sloths that had what looked like chain mail in their skin, these osteoderms here for protection. And so again, there's just this diversity. We had no idea was there waiting for us in the fossil record of these tar pits. And one of my favorites is the glyptodon, which was like a giant armadillo. And so we are actually able to find many, many pieces of its little shell here. And so these are extinct relatives of armadillos you might see today. And so now we're starting to piece together, just as we have done in Los Angeles, a new picture of what the Ice Age looked like in Trinidad. And we're starting to think that maybe it was looking like a grassland. And this makes sense because at the time, Venezuela was also a grassland, which it was connected And so we can make predictions about what extinctions happened here, how climate change might have affected the animals on this island, and also really better appreciate what diversity is left in this system. Because if we've already lost so many animals and plants from this, from this island, you know, that makes conserving what's left all the more important, right? And I just want to say that one of the coolest things that I've found is that there's still tar pits capturing animals and plants today. 
So here is actually a picture of us at Pitch Lake. We had a workshop in Trinidad with a ton of local students who are all really excited about studying tar pits. And that's actually water and a wetland on top of asphalt. So it's an entire separate ecosystem on its own that's related to the asphalt with fish swimming in the water on top of the asphalt. We also found places where insects are being actively entrapped in the present day. So you can go and actually study how insects are getting caught today. Because if we know something about how insects are getting caught today, it can better inform how we look at the fossils. Um, and one of the coolest parts of tar pits on Trinidad that we don't have in Los Angeles, that's only on Trinidad, is that they're with, associated with mud volcanoes. So I had never heard about mud volcanoes until I went to Trinidad. And so this is a picture of one here in the middle of the forest. And often where you have asphalt coming up from underground, there's also a mud volcano. And it seems like things are also getting stuck in different ways in the mud volcanoes. And you might wonder how you find a mud volcano in the forest. And it turns out that they burp. <laughs> so you have to listen for the burping noise. And that's when you know that you're near a mud volcano. And so by doing that, we've been able to find some of these sites um, in these really wild places by actually looking listening and trying to figure out where things are coming up from underground. So I just wanted to summarize all the things we've talked about and all the places we've gone. What have we learned today? So first we'd, we'd ask, well, how do paleontologists use fossils to understand past ecosystems? And based on everything I've shown you, when we find fossils, we can actually see what species were around, both plants and animals in a given place at a given time. And we can make hypotheses about how those animals and plants may have interacted to get a picture of what the world was like at that time. Then we asked, what is a tar pit and why are they special? And I hope I've convinced you that tar pits are awesome because they're some of the only places in the world where there's natural asphalt and it can preserve fossils of all the pieces of the ecosystem. So plants and animals, big and small, giving us a whole picture of the environment, not just one little piece. What was the ice age like in Los Angeles and Trinidad? Well, based on what I've shown you, there were a lot of big animals there that we don't have around today, right? There were mammoths, there were mastodons in Los Angeles and saber-toothed cats, which right, we don't have in Hollywood anymore. And then in Trinidad, there were these giant ground sloths and relatives of elephants that we also don't have around. And I think this is really important because it makes us realize how much extinction happened in the past, how many animals went extinct and disappeared off the landscape. And so to me, it makes all the animals we have left today all the more precious because they're the last survivors, right? And so now when I think about fossils, I see this is what extinction looks like. How do we avoid doing that today? And lastly, are tar pits still around today? Yes, they are around. They're still required. And so I would definitely say we need help finding them all around the world. We know where some of them are, but we're pretty sure that there are plenty of tar pits around the world that we just don't know about, that we haven't found yet. So if you find a tar pit, you have to let us know because we're still looking for them. So with that, that's all I have for you guys in terms of my presentation. There's a ton of people that I have to thank who participate in all this work. Um, but if you have any questions about tar pits or paleontology, I am happy to answer them. Question time is our favorite time of the day, Alexis. I cannot wait. I learned so much. All those fossils in Los Angeles, how cool. Um, burping, mud volcanoes, so many new tidbits to pull out at Trivia. Amazing. For folks learning along at home, we'd love to see what you found most interesting today. Maybe you're going to do a follow-up activity from our family guide. You'll draw a picture, write a story, produce a video, something like that. Whatever it is, we would love to see it. If you tag us on Twitter, at Nat Geo Education, and use hashtag Explore Classroom, we can make sure Alexis gets a chance to see all of your really cool work. Before we move to questions, I do want to do some shout outs. I've been trying to capture everything I'm seeing in the chat bar. So today it looks like our students are representing Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, DC, Delaware, Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, Kentucky, Massachusetts, 
Maryland, Missouri, Mississippi, Nebraska, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Oregon, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, Washington, Wyoming, Australia, Canada, Ireland, Romania, the United Kingdom, and Vanuatu. Very cool. I've got some special shout outs for some of you fine folks. Um, Abby, Allegra, Andrew, Ava, Bella, and Jonathan, Illyria City School in Ohio, Evelyn and Rex, Griffin Thomas Elementary, Isabella, Jace, Jack and Warren, um, Marbrook Elementary, Russell and Erica, Miss Kimball, Olivia, Plummer Elementary School, the Roche family, the Click family, the Solomons, so many people out there. I'm sure I've still missed you. So keep saying hi in the chat bar. And more importantly, start sending us your questions. We keep track of everything as it's sent in. So you only need to send it one time, but we'd love to hear them. Um, and for folks up here on screen with me, get ready with that nice loud voice. I will let you know when it's your turn. Our first question today comes to us from Rhonda Wilson, who's wondering what the biggest fossil you've ever found is. Mm, that's a great question. So some of the biggest animals that we find include things like mammoths, mastodons are really big, and giant ground sloths, right? So mammoths would have been about the size of a living elephant today. So those are some really big bones. Um, my favorite large fossil that I work with is actually from Los Angeles, the giant short-faced bear. Um, I definitely recommend checking it out. It's a bear that would have stood maybe like 10 feet tall. Um, and so I get to work with a lot of their skulls and uh, teeth. So I personally, those are my favorite large mammals, but there's a ton of large animals that we find. That's amazing. It looks like maybe a pet wandered in behind you. Our next question is, what is your dog's name? Um, my dog's name is Kit. Adorable. All right. And then our next <laughs> question comes to us from Molly Cress, who is wondering what the weirdest thing you've ever found in a tar pit is. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so many weird things. Definitely the fossil coprolites or the fossil feces. That was weird to find. Um, Another thing that's weird, one of my favorites is, you know, when you go hiking and you get those little plants that get stuck to you. Um, so we actually found those too in the tar pit. And so it's, we think maybe the animals got those little seeds with the sticky bits on them stuck to themselves. And then we found them in the tar pit. So those were cool. Cause we were like, what, what is this? Cause they're really funny looking. Love that. Well, let's take a question from an on-screen group about William and Lily. All right, guys, your microphone is on. What's your question? How many fossils did you find in all tar pits? Oh, how many fossils did we find in all the tar pits? So in Los Angeles alone, there are millions because we consider every piece of plant, every piece of insect, and then all of the vertebrates, everything from a saber toothed cat to a tiny mouse. And so there's millions just there. Then after that, there's probably millions in Venezuela too in South America. So really there's so many more to discover. I mean, we're gonna have millions of tar pit fossils from all around the world. In Trinidad though, so far we've only found about a hundred. So we're very far behind. So we have a lot of work to do to catch up to some of these other tar pits. Lyric online is wondering if anyone you've worked with has ever gotten stuck within a tar pit while you were working. That's a great question. Um, so we try to be very careful and, you know, tar pits in general, as I mentioned, they're actually just really sticky dirt. So when we're working, if you're, you're really working just on the ground in very sticky dirt, but what happens when you take that dirt away, when you're taking the fossils out, is then you get the liquid asphalt. And so we have to be very careful and use um, special protocols. I know some people, including some of my own students who have lost shoes <laughs> while we were exploring in Trinidad. So you have to be very careful where you step. And um, yeah, you can definitely sink in a little bit very quickly. And so it's always good to have the buddy system when studying tar pits. Those shoes bring up an interesting question. That really might confuse the next person to do research in that tar pit. How often do you find modern things on top of what you're looking for? 
That's a great question. And that's actually something that I think is really cool about tar pits is that they're recording life right now. So I love to think about the paleontologist hundreds of years from now who comes and studies a tar pit and finds a soccer ball, a frisbee, a shoe, and has starts to reconstruct what did lo life look like in 2020. Um, so we do find that, right? And especially in Los Angeles, soccer, there's a soccer camp in the park. <laughs> so soccer balls make an appearance very frequently, <laughs> I think. Um, and we do find modern things stuck to like modern insects. And so we need to be very careful when we document, we have to look in the layers. So the, the modern things will be at the top. So we need to make sure we don't mix them as we're digging. Fascinating. Let's grab a question from another on-screen participant. Mrs. Hagen, do you have a question from either your class or do you want me to call on one of your students? If you can call on one of my students, they're very anxious to talk with you. Do you have someone you'd like me to choose? Let's go ahead and start with Michael. Michael, Michael are you ready with your question? All right, Michael, let me get that microphone on for you. Go for it. Has there ever been discoveries of animals' bones like formed with other different species' bones? Hmm. So we definitely see animals, when we find them in a tar pit, they're not all together. So we don't find, you know, the arm, like two arms, two legs, everything in one place. We usually find just an isolated bone. And so we often find the bone of one species next to the bone of another species, um, but we don't find them kind of combined. We find them next to each other, which probably means they, they died in the same place or maybe died at a similar time. Molly Cress on YouTube is wondering, how does the tar itself form? That is a very good question that certainly a lot of geologists study. Um, Basically, so we say, I use the word tar, but that's actually a man-made substance. Really what we're talking about is asphalt, but asphalt is not as fun a word as tar, right? Um, but so asphalt is actually, as I said, naturally occurring. So in many places there's oil underground. So in Los Angeles, there's the Salt Lake oil field and they actually used to take the oil out for fuel and still do in some places in Los Angeles. And so the oil in Los Angeles is actually the result of millions and millions of dead tiny organisms known as diatoms that lived in the water millions of years ago. And so those little animals died and decomposed and eventually became oil. So they're all, one of my coworkers calls them zombie diatoms because they're these, these little creatures that died a long time ago, became oil and then came up and are now preserving all the Pleistocene ice age mammals. So. So cool. Yeah. All right, let's take another question from on screen. Let's go to Kinsey. Kinsey, your microphone's on, what's your question? Uh, my question is, have they found species in the tar pit in LA that are still alive today? Yes, so that's actually one of my favorite reasons to study tar pits in Los Angeles is because I'm interested in what they can tell us about animals that are around today future climate extinction um, drivers. So we find plenty of coyotes. And so those are still around in Los Angeles today. Uh, we find foxes, we find wood rats, we find um, squirrels, many birds that are still around today. My favorite one is the grizzly bear that we find in the tar pits because the grizzly bear is on the California state flag but it's actually no longer around in California. It was hunted to extinction in the early 1900s. And so if we wanna know about the grizzly bear, like the icon of California, you have to go to the tar pits. And so that's something that's a very recently extinct animal um, that's even in the tar pits too. Brilliant. We've got Ava who's wondering, in your opinion, what is the most exciting thing about these tar pit projects? Um, well, for me, the most exciting thing are all the cool people I get to work with. So I get to go all around the world to work with local scientists and local students to learn from them about their tar pits. Um, so I 
part of being an explorer. I love to explore. I love to go to new places, meet new people. And so with tar pits, you know, we try to share what we know about our own local tar pit with each other and help each other um, get better at our excavation techniques and our scientific techniques. So to me, that's the best part is getting to go to these places and meet new people and share the science. Awesome. Let's take a question from Ezra and Isaac. Your microphone's on. Um, ha have you found any marine life in tar pits? Sorry, could you say that again? Have I found any? Have you found any marine life in tar pits? Marine life. Okay, good question. So we have found um, freshwater life. So things like turtles and some freshwater fish. But actually, for example, in Los Angeles, we wouldn't find marine life because the um, Los Angeles was underwater for a really long time. And so then after that, that's when the tar pits were active. So they were active on, on land when there were land animals around. Yeah. But um, again, a lot of fresh water because we think maybe it was a wetland or the asphalt was mixing with water. Got a bunch of people on YouTube who are wondering just how big these tar pits are. How deep are they and how much area do they cover, Alexis? Oh, um, I, you know, I don't know the exact numbers. So in Los Angeles, the tar pits are actually within a place known as Hancock Park. And that's actually just within a few city blocks. Um, so they're pretty small in that area. I would definitely recommend going and taking a look at a map of the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles and you can get a sense of it. Some of them are about the size of a swimming pool. Um, so they can get pretty big. The one in Trinidad though, Pitch Lake is huge. It has millions of tons of asphalt. Um, it's like a giant parking lot. Like if you went to a big supermarket um, parking lot and you can walk across it. And some of them are really small. They're just, you know, maybe the size of your desk. So they all vary a lot. And that's what makes it so exciting is because you never know what you're gonna find, a big tar pit, a little tar pit and what's hiding in them. So neat, love that. Let's go to Jalen for our next question. Jalen, your microphone's on. How many tar pits have you visited? Um, I know I wanna have like a little, like National Park Service has those um, passports. I feel like I need a tar pits passport for all the tar pits I visit. So within California alone, there's the tar pit in Los Angeles, but there's actually two in the Central Valley um, in McKittrick and Maricopa, which are kind of near Bakersfield. So that's central part of California. And then there's another one on the coast close to Santa Barbara. So I've been to all of those. And then I've been to the one in Trinidad. Um, and so there's a few on Trinidad that we're exploring. And then some of my colleagues have been to the ones in Ecuador and Peru. And the one that I really want to go to is to see the one in Cuba. So I've been to about at least five and I'm hoping to go see some more. Super cool. What a fun way to travel the world. Um, we've got Cameron and a bunch of others wondering if any new species have ever been discovered within tar pits and has your team ever found one? Um, definitely. So I think there are some species that have been described from tar pits. Um, but again, the species that we're seeing in tar pits are also ones that you see at other fossil sites. We just tend to have better representations. We have more individuals and we get to have all of these fossils coming from one place. Um, I can't think of a particular new species that we just know from Los Angeles um, because that species usually has a big range. Um, but we're working on describing some potentially new species from Trinidad. We have to start looking really close at that material just because no one's looked at it in decades. Um, so we're hoping that we might find some new species. And you've been talking about describing a new species. Would you say a little bit more about what that means? Sure. So when you describe a new species, you need to show that it's actually a new species. So um, when we find a fossil, our first thing is to compare it to other bones that we know what species they're from. So I like to think of it like when you go to the, when you need to know an answer, you go to the library, right, to find a book. Well, we have like a bone library. So we find a bone in the field and then we go to our bone library where we compare the bone we don't know about to bones from animals that we, you know, we know, okay, this is a bear bone, this is a fox bone. Um, so we actually just have to sit there and look really close and compare different bones to each other until we find a match. 
And if we don't find a match, that's giving us a clue that maybe it's a new species because we don't have anything that it looks like. And then if you're really lucky, if you're working with fossils that have DNA in them, you can even use DNA to try and show that it's a new species. So there are a lot of different ways, but the first step is you have to go to your bone library. That's amazing. So school libraries are laid out on the Dewey Decimal System. What is a bone library arranged with, Alexa? Um, ours is by um, evolutionary relatedness. So we have all the carnivores in one place, all the rodents in one place, all the turtles in one place. So you have to have a general sense of like, mm, I think this might be some type of cat or maybe it's some type of frog. Then you go to the frog drawer, you pull it open and then you start comparing them. <laughs> This sounds amazing. I have like a new bucket list location to go to, but let's take a question from Elena instead of just from me. Elena, go ahead and turn your microphone on and ask a question. I'm having a little bit of difficulty with it. Um, what would LA look like if we never built a city there? You know, that's a question that a big group of researchers is working on right now where we're working with people who study the plants and animals to figure out what it looked like. Um, it's hard to say because um, not only did humans change the landscape, but also climate, right? At the end of the ice age, climate got a lot warmer. And so many of those animals like saber-toothed cats, they may have gone extinct anyway, even if humans never would have shown up. But I think if humans weren't in Los Angeles today, we probably would still have grizzly bears. We'd have a lot more mountain lions um, and they would be all across going onto the beach. So one thing that I learned that was really cool is that in the past, a lot of animals were more likely to go to the beach and eat things like dead whales. So dead whales used to come up on shore more frequently because there weren't people. And things like California condors used to spend a lot of their time on the beach. And that doesn't happen anymore because people are on the beach, right? So maybe there would have been a lot more animals on the beach moving back and forth between the beach and the forest. That could be one cool thing if humans had never come to Los Angeles. So many people on YouTube have been asking this same question. Do you ever find people bones or human ancestor bones? That is also the question I get most frequently. Um, so not really. There's one occurrence of a person from the Los Angeles tar pits um, that's about 10,000 years old. So that like an actual human bone and same from Trinidad, there's one occurrence of human bones um, that's several thousand years old. But we find a lot of artifacts actually. Um, one of the cool things is that we know people were actually going to the tar pits to use the asphalt. So one cool thing is if you've seen an abalone shell, it has like little holes. And it turns out people would use the asphalt to plug up those holes to make little waterproof vessels. People also use the asphalt to help with making fishing hooks. Um, and so we know people were using the asphalt, but they knew not to fall in, right? <laughs> Brilliant, pretty good, pretty good survival instinct there. Let's get another question from on screen. Let's go to Amanda, Madeline, Zachary, and Daniel. Your mic is, is on, folks. Go for it. Um, what is the, your favorite Ice Age animal? Hmm. So I think my bear, bear that was about 10 feet tall when it stood on its hind legs. And I think it's really cool because, um, you know, bears eat a very variable diet. They're kind of like us. They can eat a lot of meat or a lot of plants. And so working with this bear, it's kind of currently a mystery what it used to eat. Um, so one of the things I'm trying to do is figure out what this giant bear was eating. Was it eating a lot of plants? Was it eating a lot of meat? And one hypothesis is that because it was so big, it actually used to use its big body size to scare away other predators. So maybe like a dire wolf went and killed a mammoth you know, a pack of dire wolves. And then the short-faced bear saw that carcass and actually just went up and scared all those wolves away because it's so big. Um, so that's one hypothesis that we currently have to test. And another one is that maybe it was eating a lot of acorns and that's why they got a lot of cavities in Los Angeles. So there's so many questions and that's what's so cool about it. Super neat. We've got a really, really thoughtful question from Bryson on YouTube. 
Bryson noticed that list of places um, that you've been to tar pits. They all sounded pretty warm. Are tar pits mm -hmm. always in warm places? If so, why? A very good question. And again, part of it is that we just don't know where all the tar pits are. And so we need people out there exploring to help us find them. Um, what determines where a tar pit is, is actually the geology. So it, you actually have to know something about the rocks and know where oil will form, but also where oil will be able to come to the surface. You kind of need like the right ingredients to come together to get a tar pit, because there are plenty of places where we find oil all around the world, but we don't see the same type of asphalt coming and preserving fossils. So I don't think they're restricted to warm places. It's more that that's where we found them so far. Um, and that's where the geology is right. But, you know, there's clues, for example, that there might even be some in Japan. So we just, again, just have to keep looking. <laughs> Super cool. There's so much out there to explore still. Let's take our next question from Isaiah, who's up on screen with us. Isaiah, your microphone's on. Go for it. Hi. First, I want I would like to say happy Principal's Day to all to, to all out from the principals watching out there, especially our principal Miss Tran. So here's my question: How do you determine the age of the fossils, and what is the oldest fossils have you found? Hmm. Very good question. How do you determine the age? So in general, with fossils, you can get a kind of general sense of the age by how it's um, like where it's found in relation to other fossils. So right, so if the modern day is at the top, things should get older as you go deeper underground. So that's a general idea. But specifically for tar pits, we actually use a technique known as radiocarbon dating. And basically we have to study the chemistry of the atoms in the bones or plants that we find. And we kind of use this chemistry as like a little clock to figure out how old, uh, like kind of when the animal died at a given time in the past. And currently the oldest is probably around 50 or 60,000 years old, but that's also the limit of that technique. So I'm sure there are older fossils that are in tar pits, but that we're not yet exploring other techniques. So there's still, again, a lot of space to discover more things. <laughs> Amazing. We've got Erica on YouTube, who is curious if you can pick a favorite out of all the fossils you've found and worked with. Mm. I love the coprolites. I just love them. The fossil feces and the little fossil poops, they're like this big. And the reason I love them so much um, is because for a long time, the, the excavators who work at the museum had been finding them, but they assumed because no one had ever found fossil poop before at the tar pits, that they must have been contamination. So they thought that a invasive rat from the city, like a city rat was coming in and maybe just, you know, went to the bathroom on the fossils and left it there. But then I went in um, because I personally have pet rats. I love rats. I was like, that's not, that's not city rat poop that's something else. And so using our scientific techniques of radiocarbon dating, like our last question, I was able to show that they're 50,000 years old. So it couldn't have been a city rat. And um, we thought it was just the funniest thing ever. And it was one of those things where paleontologists, honestly, some of our favorite things are coprolite science or poop science. So that will always be my answer every time. <laughs> Love that. Let's see if Michael has a question. Michael, your microphone's on. Um. Is there ever been like a, like one of the fossils from the dinosaur in a tar pit, like way underground? Mm. So um, not that anyone has found yet, but dinosaurs in general are really, really old. They're on the scale of millions of years old. And the tar pits that we've been studying so far really only have things that are thousands of years old. So, um, they may not have been around at the same time. So maybe the tar pits weren't active um, to catch dinosaurs or um, we just haven't found the right ingredients yet. So it's possible, but everything we've seen so far, it seems like they're mostly looking at things thousands of years old. Brilliant. And Alexis, do you have any advice for all the young explorers joining us today? You know, for me, I just love 
being outside and exploring and finding new things and asking questions. And, you know, the work that I've been doing with tar pits, really, it's just been finding something and asking a question about it. And then it leads me down this rabbit hole of, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Um, so I would say, just keep asking questions, go outside and explore. But also a lot of the work that I do is on my laptop. I know right now it's kind of hard to get outside sometimes. And so um, even going on maps and looking to see where else could there be a tar pit, looking at satellite images, you can do a lot online. Um, one of the most helpful things that you could do for us, actually, um, we like modern day paleontologists, we need to know something about the diversity of an area as it is today to think about the past. So if you go out and start thinking about or taking down a notebook of what animals and plants are in your local area, that's actually really helpful for paleontologists because then we can use that to think about, well, what did the past look like? So cool. And Alexis, if people have more questions about tar pits, is there anywhere they should go to ask them or answer them themselves? Sure. So I would definitely recommend um, the La Brea Tar Pits website, tarpits.org. Um, and on that is the one specifically about Los Angeles, but also a page about tar pits of the world. And so keep an eye out because we're still trying to put as much information as we can as we find new things. Amazing. Well, for everyone watching along at home, please check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. You can tune in at 2 p.m. Eastern time on Monday for our next event, Rainforest Discovery with Meg Lohman, who's better known as Canopy Meg. That'll be pretty fun. And you can keep an eye out for new special editions of Explorer Classroom made specifically for grades pre-K through two and for high school. So if you've got younger or older siblings or you know teachers who teach those grades, let them know. We're running one a week of those special events through June. All right, students. I'm gonna ask to turn on everybody's microphones. Let's say goodbye and thank you to Alexis. Ready? Bye. 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 Bye.